everybody, to the Huddle Up podcast, presented as always by Mile High Huddle, powered by Overtime Media. I'm your host, Chad Jensen. With me, as always, my partner in crime on this podcasting odyssey. You know him well. You love him. He is Zach Kelberman. Zach, we've been anxiously kind of monitoring what in the Sam Hill is going to happen with the Broncos quarterbacks coach vacancy. And even though we've kind of had it under our hat, we've been told pretty much common knowledge by this point that Mike Shula was going to be the guy. There just wasn't any movement for a good 10 to 14 day window almost. Well, he finally got boots on the ground. He was, he's been in Denver today. Of course, we're recording this. This is live on a Thursday evening to interview with Vic Fangio as of 625 Thursday evening, local time. He hasn't, there's been no official announcement of his hire, but Zach, at this point, it's got to simply be a matter of course. It's inevitable, Chad. This is just a formality at this point. Like we mentioned yesterday, they're just crossing the T's and dotting the I's. It's going to happen. There's a very high likelihood. Not many other candidates out there. Uh, One thing we didn't touch on, though, one comment we got yesterday was John Kitna as a potential option quarterbacks Mm. coach. I would not mind that at all. I think he had a really good year with Dallas and Dak Prescott. That would be a good fallback plan, but it's looking like Mike Shula right now. Familiarity, continuity with Pat Shermer goes back to the Giants, so that's going to happen, Chad. Yeah, I wouldn't be opposed to that. The only thing you're losing, if you were to go with someone besides Mike Shula, like a Kitna, is that history of working together that Shermer and Shula have. Right. How much, how valuable that is, hard to say, because in so many ways, the offensive coordinator, whoever the offensive play caller is, I mean, they're working with that quarterback so much. They are a quarterback coach. It's just a guy that's going to manage the room and worked specifically on technique, be in the film room. That's more what the quarterback's coach himself is going to do. But I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be opposed to the idea, but Zach, it doesn't sound like the Broncos are thinking that way as far as kidding. Yeah. It's Pat, uh, excuse me, Pat Shermer. It's uh, uh, all the way they're going with the guy they have in, uh, in in town right now. And I think Mike Shula is going to be the guy. It's been a foregone conclusion. And like I said, it's just a formality. So hopefully Elway talked about, continuity doesn't matter. He wants good continuity. So hopefully this is the good continuity he's hoping to get with this, uh, this marriage here. I heard him say that and I was, and then I just had to laugh because after, you know, preaching that the, the continuity word for the last year, basically, especially as it re- applied and related to drew Locke, for him to go back on that and then say also, no, I'm not going back. I meant continuity and that's still important. That is important to me, but really what I meant was good continuity. In other words, Rich Gangarello, bad content. <laughs> but how about this, though? I mean, you th- coming from the guy who kept Vance Joseph for two years, so that really a little hypocritical to me, Chad, but that's another story. In his defense, even though he botched the Vance Joseph hire and passed over Kyle Shanahan, who's now in the Super Bowl, he recognized the gravity of his mistake one year later and wanted to go to Mike Shanahan, Papa Shanny, right? right. And was uh, – you know, vetoed, vetoed. Joe Ellis put his tail in a knot, said, no, you're going to have to go through an entire like coaching interview process. And, you know, Ellis might not have been totally wrong on that. Like we know that that beef existed between he and Shanahan to what degree that, that beef really was, is anyone's guess. We just know that there was some kind of a rift between them, some kind of a beef, but you can't necessarily even say that he was wrong because Shanahan would have been an upgrade over Vance Joseph, no doubt. Mike Shanahan, I mean, but like, who's to say Vic Fangio wouldn't have ultimately been a better option for the Broncos long term than bringing back Mike, you know? And it, but it required waiting one more year. I mean, I guess he could have gone through the coaching interview process with Fangio at the end of the 2017 season, but Fangio's star hadn't quite burned, even though he'd been in the league so long. It took that 2018 campaign with the Bears, leading him to number one across like 19 defensive categories, for him to finally arrive as a true candidate for head coach. You know, hindsight, of course, is twenty twenty, and I think everyone was so dissatisfied with Vance Joseph. Everyone wanted him out of town that we wanted Mike Shanahan to come back, and he wouldn't have been a good mesh with the, with the current-day NFL and the current organization structure of the Broncos. It, it, things worked out the way they worked out, and they got a good head, head coach in Vic Fangio. They had to only go through two years of Vance Joseph to get him, so all's well that ends well, Chad. Guys, I want to talk a little bit more about Shula, just so fans understand what the Broncos are getting in this guy as a quarterback's coach. Drew Locke's position coach for the foreseeable future. First, though, just a couple. And by the way, see the super chat rolling in. We're going to get to your question. This, you know, the majority of this podcast is going to be about you guys, your questions, your comments. It is the Mile High Mailbag because we are your football priests. You know that. 
But first, we have to just take care of a couple of quick matters of business. Make sure, guys, you're following the show on Twitter, at HuddleUpPod. we got to remind you each and every podcast because the show is growing exponentially, especially on YouTube and especially on Facebook. So if you haven't, take some time. Head on over to, uh, to Twitter and follow the show, at HuddleUpPod. Simply the best way to keep your finger on the pulse of what's happening with the show in real time. Also, last matter of business, don't forget, head on over to Apple Podcasts and leave a creative review. And if you like what Zach and I are doing, if you like even what Nick and Carl are doing, Lance and Eric, leave us a five-star review. Tell us what you like about the show. It's a great organic way for you to support what we're doing here. And it also enters you into our monthly drawing where we give away randomly some swag, whether it be a hat, whether it be a shirt, whether it be a hoodie. And uh, so take care of that business. Zach, let's just get to it now. Let's, let's tell them, listen, We've been promising, speaking of swag, we've been promising for how long? Three months that we were going to yeah. get a, a merch store up. And we have finally come through and fulfilled that promise. However, before everyone gets all stoked and, and you know geeked out of your mind about it, right now, as of today, we launched the site. There's only one product that you can purchase, and it's the same shirt that's, that Zach's wearing right now. However... By as soon as this weekend, there are going to be multiple other products that are going to go on there, including hoodies, yeah. including hats. We're working with a guy right now. The reason there's a slight delay, we're working with a guy, a designer right now, who's putting together some designs that we're going to slap onto these, uh, the shirts, the hats, the the beanies, the hoodies. And that there's just a little bit of a download time, a little gap in between well, while he's working that out and when we can get it actually lit up on the website. So in the meantime, guys, I'm going to put this in the comment stream. We get a lot of questions daily. In fact, I get questions about where can I buy merch? Where can I get merch? Right now, it's only one shirt. I'm going to put it in the comment stream, and then you guys, you know, bookmark it, do whatever you want. Right there, boom. Huddle dot, or excuse me, huddle dash up dash pod dot my shopify dot com. So it's going into the comment stream right now. We will tweet it out. We will share it out there. Check our personal accounts. Like if the comment stream blows by and you weren't able to grab it, check it out and. Um, We'll be circling back, but Zach, credit to you. You were the one that put the the elbow grease into getting this thing going. Primarily, I came in at the end, a couple quick finishing touches, and now we're finally able to uh, to launch it. So we hope you guys enjoy. Yeah, like we mentioned yesterday, Chad, you and I both juggle so many different things on a daily basis. So it was obviously not our top priority, but it was a priority for us, and we wanted to get it going. We're gonna roll out more things as we go along. We're gonna, there's so many options we can bring you guys. Everything from shirts and shorts to stickers and coffee mugs. We're gonna roll out things on a incremental basis. But right now, that staple shirt, the, the one I'm wearing right now, is up on the store already. So if you guys want to go purchase that, it's available for you. And look for Sunday. Might have a new product in the store. So a little teaser there. Yeah, of course, this is our last podcast for this week as far as Zach and I, but we'll be back in the saddle on Sunday, 6 p.m. Mountain, 8 p.m. Eastern, and uh, hopefully by then, not hopefully, we should and will by then have the news of some additional items, some additional options for you to to check out on the merch store, including specific things we hope to have up for our awesome female listeners. That's not just like a dude t-shirt that you can try and find. So we're working on that. In the meantime, check that out, you guys. The link is in the comment stream, and then we'll tweet it out after the show. Mr. Boggins jumps in with a $7.89 donation on thank Super you. Chat. We thank you, Mr. Boggins. Appreciate you. What do you believe is the higher off-season priority, offense and building around Drew Locke, or defense and building to slow down Mahomes? Zach, what's your answer for Mr. Boggins? It has to be offense. The defense is mostly in place, Chad. If they can retain a few pieces there and add some supplemental pieces, they have the good scheme in place. They have Fangio as the head coach and his background is defense. Where they're going to win or lose games is on offense. That's true locks progression. It's why they hired a new coach, a new quarterback coach, a coordinator. Uh, they want the offense to be com competitive in the NFL with 2020 and for the next two, three, four, five, ten years. So absolutely, you can contain Patrick Mahomes with this defense, but is the offense the deciding factor can they score more points in Kansas City so in my opinion Chad this entire offseason has to be about helping out Drew Locke his protection his weapons everything around Locke he is the future of the franchise and you have to nurture that as much as possible yeah I mean I've heard a few of our colleagues in in local media say you know this year this is the year it's got to be about offense in the draft well you know, I hate to break it to you in case you missed it, but last year's draft was all about offense. The first three picks were offensive players. Yeah. Now, I'm not saying that 
that means they need to go defense this year. I agree with you, Zach, that now's the time. Like, look, when you have one of the greatest defensive minds in the NFL as your head coach and kind of, you know, watching over as the steward of that defense, you can afford to scrimp a little bit on the personnel because you know from, from an X's and O's coaching and, and scheme perspective, that's going to make up for, you know, potentially any, any deficits you might have in personnel. So that's the strength. Let it, let it be for now the strength. And this is the time to invest in your offense. I agree with Zach. I agree with, um, I guess Mr. Uh, Boggs wasn't making a, a statement there, but I do agree with you. You got to build the offensive line. You got to get a complimentary X re- or a Z receiver to Cortland Sutton's X. Yes. And just keep stacking wood on that fire and building that nest for Drew Locke. Yeah, I mean, the defense, I would say, Chad, especially in the second half of last season, they were pretty close to elite as far as I'm concerned. Pass defense against the run, they were pretty tight. They were pretty stout. The offense has some work to do, but if Locke progresses and they have the right coordinator and coach in place now, they can compete with the Chiefs. They can compete with the the Ravens in the AFC. They can have that firepower, and it could be, you never know, the year of Drew Locke. But it all depends on this offseason. It's helping him out with his protection, because right now it doesn't cut it, and his offensive weaponry, because right now it doesn't cut it. If those two things get fixed this offense will be competitive and the Broncos will finally have Chad a well-rounded team speaking of the year of Drew Locke did you see the shade Matthew Judon or Judon however you pronounce his yes. name yes yeah through at Drew Locke uh, the other day on Twitter we I'm shocked at that Chad we haven't covered it I'm going to get an article up on it reacting in the written form here soon but for those of you who missed it let me find the tweet and then I'll do a quick sh- screen share uh, let's see here so a fellow by the name of Jack on Twitter tweeted an image that included a four-part image that included Lamar Jackson, Patrick Mahomes, uh, Deshaun Watson, and Drew Locke, four quarterbacks. And in it, he said, the future of the league. And Matthew Judon, or Juden, however you pronounce it again, let me share this real quick. He kind of poo-pooed on that. Let me let me share this over, and then we'll grab Rebel, Rebel's uh, question here real quick, just so you guys can check this out. Okay, um, hold on. Let me just maximize. I'm going to take Zach and I out of this just for a second so you guys can see, and I guess I better turn off his question. Bear with me one second, you guys. We'll come back to you, Rebel. Don't worry. All right, you can see that. The future of the league, you got Lamar Jackson, you got Mahomes, you got Watson, and Locke. Matthew Judon, who put Drew Locke in this picture? Stop playing. And I think it's funny, but what was your gut reaction when you saw that, Zach? I mean, it's like an Adam Rank saying the Broncos are going 2-14, and 14, and it's like any other... I don't even know. He used to be a former player, correct? I, I believe, and now he turned analyst or whatever. It's just He's just tweeting about something? No, no. Oh, you mean the original tweeter? Judon. No, Wasn't Judon he? Judon's outside linebacker for the Ravens, I believe. Yeah, okay, nine so and a half sacks. He, he just made the Pro Bowl. So he's still... I mean, it's... it's. I, I don't really put too much stock in it, Chad. It's one guy's opinion, and obviously until the Broncos get back on the map, they're not going to have that respect from outsiders, but we know that it could be the year of Drew Locke, and we know the Broncos are in the right hands now. So, again, one man's opinion. My eyes, I trust more than Matthew Judon's tweeting. So Yeah, he, he came into the league in 2016 as a fifth-round pick, and he has kind of worked his way up the ladder there in Baltimore as a, finally became a starter, I think it was last year. And this year was his kind of breakout year. If it wasn't such a high profile season for the team because of what Lamar was doing, I doubt that Judon's making the the Pro Bowl. But yeah, he's a, he's an edge defender. And basically, the way I interpreted that is like, look, he's saying, look, the three guys mentioned here have all produced at least one full season as a starter. Drew Locke hasn't yet. He's only got five starts in the NFL. On one hand, I can understand why he's going. Don't put him in their category yet, right? Because Lamar, Mahomes, and Watson, they've all kind of paid their dues already. They're all still very young in their respective careers, entered the league within a couple of years of each other. But Drew Locke still has a little bit of a hill to climb. And let's face it, Judon hasn't gone head-to-head against Drew Locke. The Broncos played the Ravens last year in 2018, I mean, when Joe Flacco was still a Baltimore Raven and Judon got an up close look at a Keenum led Broncos, but he hasn't faced Drew Locke. So this is just, you know, shade. Let it be bulletin board material for Locke, right. bulletin board material for the Broncos. I was going to say the Broncos thrive by being the underdog, by being disrespected. So the more bulletin board material, the more disrespect they can accumulate this offseason, it's only going to help them out. And it's only going to take more by surprise when they do have a good season this year. And it could be the year of Drew Locke. So Matthew Judon, you're entitled to your opinion, but doesn't mean much to me. 
Rebels wants to know, doesn't anyone else want to sign Shula? Yes, absolutely. He's a he's a very he's a coach that is in demand year after year in the NFL. The reason why he's out there, two reasons. One, he was he was his head coach who hired him was fired. And so his contract was nullified. Yeah. But the Giants, the new regime there, was a judge, the new head coach there. And yeah. uh, no, no, yeah. not, is it judge? Yeah. Anyway, regardless, they interviewed him for the offensive coordinator job to stay as offensive coordinator, ended up going to Jason Garrett. But beyond that, the problem is all the other jobs have been filled up to this point for the most part. And so he's, you know, it's kind of lines up perfectly for him and the Broncos to get together and, and uh, make some magic. I hate that that notion that just because, you know, no one else wanted to hire him, he's not a good coach. I mean, that's what happens when a new regime comes in. It happened last year. They cleaned out all of Vance Joseph's assistants, or most of them. They want to bring in their own guys. So it, once Shermer was out, Shula was going to be out. And he is a good quarterback coach in his own right. He has a pedigree. He's familiar with Shermer. He's not the head coach. He's not the offensive coordinator. They can do a lot worse at quarterback coach than bring him in. Not a lot out there right now, but it's a good. to me, it's a good call. Appreciate you, Brent. He says, you gentlemen are a godsend. I remember back in the day having to scour the Rocky Mountain News and Denver Post for any Bronco-related news. And I can relate to this. I'm probably dating myself a little bit here. So here we go. But I can remember even like as – you remember the year – now, Zach, you, this was probably before your time. But for Broncos fans who've been following this team for a long time, you remember the year Ruben Drones busted out as a 1,000-yard rusher for this team post-Clinton Portis trade? It was 2004, I believe. Even – you know, that's that's post-internet revolution, right? The internet existed, but it was before it became such an information. It was mostly e-commerce, chat rooms. Information still was coming out, for the most part, in print, right? And I would wake up on, uh, I think it was Monday. No, it was Tuesdays of each week, and I'd drive down to my local gas station, and I would pick up the sporting news because it had all of the statistics on each player so I could kind of keep up with how where is drones, you know, in the league rushing, you know, pushing for the for the rushing champ title. Where's he at? Where's he fall? How's Jay Plummer doing? Where's Rod Smith fall in the in the wide receiver rankings? Where's the team rank overall? Blah, blah, blah. That's how much things have changed. And yeah, it makes it easy, Zach, where we're literally bringing this podcast to your pocket. A lot of you probably when this one goes live, you get a little bing, bing live and you go, oh, cool information on my team from a couple of guys who know what they're talking about. So yeah, we appreciate you guys, but it is crazy if I think about it, how much it's changed and and thank God because it's given us the opportunity to do what we do. It, yeah, it's true. And going back to 2004, I mean, the pre-Twitter age, the pre-social media age, there was internet, but it was so archaic compared to now. And uh, it's gotten a lot better in that sense. I believe social media has a lot of downfalls for society. That's a whole other topic, but uh, it did increase our uh, visibility and our interaction with Broncos fans. So we do appreciate that and all the support as always, guys. I'm not sure what this means, Zach, that Chad looks like a West Coast gangster <laughs> with all the different colors of his mouth. Oh, his Mile High Huddle hats. There we go. Yeah, I, I like to mix it up, you know. <laughs> I try and like match with what what I'm wearing. Um, all right, let's find some questions here, guys. Fashion police. Let's see what we got here from Jordan. How do the Broncos compare to other wild card teams like the Bills and the Titans? What's your take, Zach? I believe they're right there. I mean, they beat the Titans, Chad, and I believe they can compete with the Bills. The defense can hold, certainly hold the Bills' offense in place, and like I keep saying, if Drew Locke can develop ahead of schedule or on schedule, they can be right up there with those 10-6 and six teams, those wild-card teams, and I expect that to happen, all things considered, if the stars align next season. So, yes, they're going to be right there with them, and they could be. You never know. The Titans got hot at the right time with the right quarterback. That can definitely happen to the Broncos next year. You never really know. I expect them to, though be in the playoff picture. Very similar. Like when we talk about what could happen, you know, on one hand, I could see Drew Locke storming onto the scene in year two and blowing the doors down, similar to how Mahomes and Lamar Jackson did. I could also see him just being a consistently strong young quarterback for this team, winning tight games, winning close games, and pushing for the playoffs and being a wild card, similar to what you saw from Josh Allen this year. There's a, I mean, there's, there are some similarities, but in this case, I think it's more, if you want to kind of hope for the best plan for the worst, I think eight and eight's probably in my opinion, I think, well, seven and nine is probably the floor. I think with Drew Locke, when this new offense, Vic Fangio having two full seasons, you know, with this defense, the players, two off seasons to acclimate to his scheme. 
I think the Broncos can push for a wild card, Zach. I'm just not convinced yet that they're going to have what it takes to, to compete, truly compete with the Kansas City Chiefs. And you can talk to a lot of people in Denver media, and they'll just scoff at the idea that Broncos are even anywhere close to being able to compete. And I understand that because they they seem to regress as far as where they stand with the Chiefs this past year. Instead of losing by a single score like they did under Vance and Case Keenum in 2018, they were getting blown out both games. But I think with the right picks in the draft and the right moves in free agency and you know young players continuing to turn the corner, Drew Locke, Phillip Lindsay. No fan, Cortland Sutton. They could potentially. I'm just not counting on. Yeah, I was gonna. I, I mean, think they're a little far away from competing for the West, but they were competitive against the Chiefs in 2018, like you mentioned, Chad. They were right there. They could have won both of those games, or at least the first game. So uh, if the offense progresses and the defense, another year under Vic Fangio, I, they can hold them down. They can potentially upset them. But I don't think the division is in the cards yet. But playoff wild card, I expect eight and eight, nine and seven to be the floor next year. A little optimistic. But I'm counting on Locke to take that next step. Max says on YouTube, I hear Peyton and Eli's nephew is shattering all of their high school records. Maybe another Manning in Denver. Speaking to, of course, this is Arch Manning, who is the son of Cooper, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, son of Cooper. Mm -hmm. It's That's so far distantly down the road at this stage that, you know, it's like if if Drew Locke completely ends up busting out in Denver. I mean, this kid's still – what, five years away from probably being even eligible for the NFL? I'm not sure exactly his age, but it is exciting to see another young Manning kind of growing his legend down there. And eventually, yeah, he's going to be a player on the scene, but don't get your hopes up that it's going to be in Denver. Poor Cooper, though, Chad. His two brothers are Hall of Fame quarterbacks. His son is going to be an NFL quarterback, and he's just Cooper Manning. So (laughs) you hate to see the black sheep of that family come out. I remember when Peyton was at the height of his dominance in Denver. Um. I can't. I, th- I think it was ESPN. It might have been NFL Network. Did the book of Manning and kind of broke down the Manning family story and Archie and the tragedy of his upbringing with his father and you know how it affected him raising his boys the way he did and he becoming a pro quarterback himself and it told the story of what happened with Cooper. Cooper didn't. He played a little quarterback when he was like Pop Warner, but when he got to high school, he wanted to play wide receiver. He wanted to be different than dad. And it ended up what happened is he probably could have gone on and got some division one scholarships as a, as in fact, I think he might've had some offers, but he had some kind of weird neck condition that restricted, you know, the, the tunnel in his bones in his spine that separate that, that surrounds your uh, spinal cord. And it was putting like pressure on it. And if he would have continued to play, he would literally have been at risk of becoming paralyzed. But yeah, your point's not lost on me though. Like you see Peyton Manning, Eli, the two quarterbacks who have made the most money in NFL history, both of which <laughs> over two hundred fifty thousand uh, million, excuse me, two hundred fifty million dollars they've each made just with their NFL salaries, not counting endorsements and all that. Those two alone have made half a billion dollars, dude, mm. in in the NFL. Wow. So yeah, you got to feel for Coop a little bit. I'm sure that he's well taken care of, though. So yeah. you know what, what he doesn't get in terms of playing on the field. I'm I'm sure his his brothers take care of him. So all's well that ends well again. Mark jumps in five dollar donation on Thank you, Mark. Chat. Will the Broncos stay at pick fifteen? Trade up or down? Your thoughts, my football priest. Hashtag Chad Gangsta. Hashtag Zach <laughs> Pern, still using Pern as a permanent right. nickname. Permanent nickname for Zach. Listen, I uh, if I had to bet on it today, I would wager that the Broncos stay at pick fifteen. But you never know. John Elway's showing a penchant. If the price is right, he'll move back. If the price is right, he moved up for Shane Ray. He moved up for Paxton Lynch. Right. Every other trade in the first round, he's traded down. You know what? I would tend to agree with you as it stands on January 23rd. Obviously, I want to see how the free agent, you know, that plays out free agency and also, the, you know, the how other teams draft ahead of the Broncos. But if I had a gun to my head right now, I think they stay at 15. The one thing they won't do, I think, Chad, is trade back. If they fall in love with the prospect, they might move up because they have the capital this year. But, yeah, I think right now they stay at 15. Ryan says, I love what Brandon Perna calls Drew Locke and even sells the T-shirts. I think we all know what that is. It starts with a horse and ends with a lock, right? It's a family show. It is a family show. (laughs) And one thing, bless Brandon's heart, we love him. The one thing that Brandon doesn't have to worry about so much as we do is network affiliation. And uh, it wouldn't go so well for for the networks that we are (laughs) affiliated with. But we love it too. It's funny as heck. Jose jumps in. $5 donation on Super Jose. Appreciate you, Jose. Would it be smart to focus on defense and free agency? The Joneses, speaking of Byron and Chris Jones, 
and build a young offense yes. through the draft. Yeah, I mean, if you want to fill the, the immediate holes on the roster, like in terms of if you had to play a football game today, the immediate holes are the cornerbacks, the D-line. So, yeah, it, it makes sense to use free agency for that, fill those holes so that you can, you know, kind of stay more true to BPA in the draft. I've been saying this for a couple of podcasts now, Chad. If they lose two defensive linemen, I think they'll get, you know, maybe not a Chris Jones, but they have some other options out there. Maybe Akeem Hicks. I mean, they can go for an inside linebacker, cornerback. They're going to shore up a lot of the insurance moves, a lot of the depth moves in free agency and leave the offense to the draft. Because right now, there's not a wide receiver to a burner on the open market, potentially, unless they trade for one. There's not a tackle. We just went through the list the other day, Chad, of available offensive linemen in the free agent class this year, is slim picking. So I believe they'll go for the offense mostly in the draft. And like you said, lead the defense for free agency. And there are some value options out there as, far, as it relates to interior O-line that they could pursue. But I, I tend to agree with you. Buana B says, do you see the Utah State quarterback, Jordan Love, going in the top 15? Would love him going to the Chargers or Raiders. So would we. Love to see that. Um, my bet, I've, I've heard conflicting things from people in the know as it relates to the draft and buzz. He's looked good at the Senior Bowl thus far, the first few days at the Senior Bowl. And I think he, by the time it's all said and done, you get through the Senior Bowl, Zach, you get through the Combine. He's such a talented, raw player, but he is in raw form. Yeah. I could see him going back into the first round. I don't know about before the 15th pit. Yeah, I'm with you there. I think he could creep into the first round. He could help his stock, like you said, over the coming months in the pre-draft process. But he right now, to me, is a back-end uh, first-round pick, maybe even high second-round pick. Again, Locke was supposed to be a top-10 pick last year. He went 42 overall, so you never really know. All right, bear with me, guys. I want to make sure I don't miss any of our superstars here. Mark jumps back in with another super chat. Thank you, Mark. All right, guys, been working. Just wanted to say thank you for what you do. <laughs> Hashtag Orange Crush. Appreciate you. We love you, Mark. Appreciate you, bro. Jordan jumps in $5 donation. Thank you, Jordan. Means a ton, brother. Um, let's see. Also, Stu, $10, our, our number one super chat the superstar. Best. You guys the are best. awesome. Love this pod with all the great fans. We love it's you, cool. Stu. We love you, dude. And it's become the it's become a you know, a little cultural phenomenon within Broncos country because we get up here and we talk, we share our thoughts, we share our analysis, and even though we kind of drive it, you guys are as much a part of the conversation as we are. And I think, you know, that's that's something unique that we bring to the table. I mean, there a lot of radio shows and a lot of different podcasts do a mailbag where they'll answer questions from their listeners, and that's common, but being able to affect the conversation in real time. That's a unique aspect, and we appreciate you guys taking the time to be a part of that with us. Uh, Jeremy jumps in <clears throat> on Facebook. Do you expect the Broncos to re-sign Chris Harris? Do I expect it, Zach? No, but I'm not ruling it out. It's still very much right. a possibility, but the latest buzz coming out of the Senior Bowl from Tony Pauline is that the Philadelphia Eagles yep. are expected to, I can't remember the exact verbiage, but hit him hard. Uh, like They're, they're going to pursue him hard. Yeah, they're going to aggressively aggressively pursue Chris Harris Jr. and Byron Jones. That's a scuttlebutt right now. And I would think about a 35-40% chance he comes back to Denver. It's not it, unlikely. It's not improbable. But he's going to have to take a major discount. He wants to get paid. I don't think the Broncos are going to pony up for that. So don't hold your breath on Chris Harris Jr. in 2020. Terry jumps in. $5 donation. Awesome Thank as you, always. Terry. Appreciate you, Terry. It means a ton. Christy. I love MHH and Huddle Up is seriously the best pod. Thank we you. Appreciate you. That means a ton to us. Oh, and she follows that up with the super chat. Thanks, Thank Christy. You. You've been with us for a long time, and that means a ton to us both. Let's grab Clay here. <clears throat> Honest question on Facebook: Do you think Drew Locke can stand up to the new evil empire, the Chiefs, and start up a big rivalry like the new Manning versus Brady? Imagine Locke versus Home uh, mm. Holmes for the next ten years. Does that get you guys excited? It does. Yep. You know, I, I do get excited by that prospect. I think there's a more than fair chance that that will happen. Like Drew Locke is legit. The Broncos, you know, they could have done a better job <clears throat> immediately following the season to broadcast their true feelings about Drew Locke. Again, I know I understand that what Elway said in the moment at this end of season presser, Zach, was basically to translate for him, but I have to translate. That's why it's it was mystifying that, well, we don't really have much choice. We, you know, we got to go with Drew Locke. Like, the way it came off, right or wrong, the way it came off to fans, it was a very lukewarm endorsement of Drew Locke. When in reality, Zach, 
the Broncos are head over heels about Drew yep. Locke. They are excited about what they have. And so that should excite fans as well. And I think to answer your question, Clay, looking forward into the future, Zach, that's going to be a matchup that is that could end up producing some fireworks. It's just yep. a matter of how soon can the Broncos stack those pieces around Locke to give him the ability, <clears throat> excuse me, to go toe to toe. Win, lose, or draw, Chad, Mahomes versus Locke is going to be the matchup in the AFC West for the next, I would say, three to five years at the minimum. Derek Carr is in the future. Obviously, Phillip Rivers is in the future. So the two young quarterbacks of the future in the West are Mahomes and Locke. And when they get on the field together, we're going to see some fireworks. I don't know about Manning versus Brady just yet. They have a ways to go before they get to that level rivalry, but it's going to be fun watching them play at least twice a year. Aaron Lynch jumps in, $10 donation on Super Chat. Been very consistent in your support, Aaron. We appreciate you, bro. What about making moves <clears throat> for someone like Corey Littleton? Now, for those of you who don't know, linebacker played with the Rams. I don't hear linebacker as a high-priority need, but shutting down the middle of the field is crucial, especially with KC in the division. Littleton's a guy that Eric Trickle was high on. I don't know. I can't remember if it was last year or the year before when he was either an RFA or a free agent. I can't remember exactly. But, uh, yeah, he would be he would be a good option under the radar, kind of low-key in Fangio's system, which is very friendly to middle linebackers and also very friendly to safeties. I could see him, you know, kind of coming out of nowhere as far as the NFL is concerned. He's been a starter in L.A. at times, but I could really see him being a, a factor. I like Corey Littleton's game, but middle linebacker, especially depending on what happens with Todd Davis, like if they end up, cutting him to save five million on the cap linebacker goes from being like a medium level need to like category you know whatever need you got to get you got to find someone there yeah it's true I, I don't consider it right now to be a huge need but like you said if they cut one of their starters they don't like Josie Jewell as a starter obviously they're left with AJ Johnson that's not going to cut it so uh, it depends on the contract depends on money of course if he wants to take a huge bank breaking contract probably not going to happen in Denver but if they can work something out maybe uh a middle of the road type pact, I would expect the Broncos to show some interest, but it all comes down to what they want to do with Davis. If they bring him back, obviously they're set there. If not, they need a starter. So we'll have to wait and see. Malachi Smith jumps in $10 donation. You. Appreciate, Appreciate you, Malachi. I don't see a question, but I'll keep an eye out in the stream for anything you've got, brother. Um, let's see here. Let me keep going. I don't want to skip anybody here. Machiavelli, the goat, the Eagles going to go. <clears throat> that's what it is. Go hard after Chris Harris Jr., like Dewey Cox. Instead of walking hard, they're going to go hard after Chris Harris Jr. But honestly, I'm at peace with him going because the price will be too high. He's only got about one or two solid seasons left. Love him, though. And that's if it's, if that's what it comes down to and he ends up leaving, it's it's you'd rather – you don't want to see him crash and burn as a Bronco. Like, let that happen elsewhere and let him come back and, uh, you know, eventually come into the ring of fame. I mean, he wants to get paid, and the Eagles last year, before the trade deadline, Chad, a lot of rumors floating around their interest in him as well. So if they get a chance to sign him on the open market, they'll probably take the chance for that. And like I said, if he wants to get top five cornerback money, that is not going to happen in Denver. The Broncos made that very clear last year when they chose not to give him a multi-year extension. He probably, for what my opinion counts for, he's done in Denver. But if he goes to the Eagles, I don't think he has many good seasons ahead of him. Let him get burned there and blame people elsewhere there rather than the Broncos. I'm trying to find, there was a question, a fella hit me up on Facebook today. <clears throat> he had actually asked a question a couple of days ago, and I told him I'd get it on the pod, and then I forgot, you know, juggling the actual live podcast. So I'm going to pull that up while we grab the next question here, and hopefully we can get to that. Bear with me a second on on uh, Trick Lessons. He uh, says, I used to watch all the Andrew Mason videos in the early mm -hmm. internet days. Andrew Mason's a legend when it comes to covering this team. And, you know, he's gone back and forth from working for the team. Now he works for uh, the DNVR. He also was a little independent for a while. He had a, a website of his own called Max Denver. Andrew Mason is absolutely a legend. And I don't, uh, I mean, I'm a fan. He's, he's great at what he does. Very knowledgeable. I mean, like, you know, savant level historian yeah. of not only the Broncos, he's written a book on the Broncos history, by the way, but the NFL at large. Um, Larry jumps in on Facebook. If the Browns don't retain Kareem Hunt, is that somebody the Broncos could pursue, Zach? I mean, I I like the idea, and I lost followers on Twitter because I suggested the Broncos would go after him. A lot of people don't like his off-the-field baggage, and I understand that, but as a player, he would really fit this system well. As a pass-catching back, he can uh, pass block, he can obviously run. He would be a great one-two punch with Phillip Lindsay. 
I just don't know if the Broncos want to take on that kind of PR hit, but if they do, it would certainly help out this offense. Chad, be a monumental upgrade on both Royce Freeman and Devontae Booker. I agree. I found this question. It's from Brian Keenow. Forgive me, Brian, if I got your name wrong. He says, if we get Shula hired as the quarterback's coach and Pat Shermer as the OC, how much will this help Drew Locke? He's a very smart kid that seems to take coaching really well, considering how much he progressed over the last year. And then implementing a system that will play into his strengths, he seems to have everything you need in a franchise quarterback. How do you think he will look next year? I have a feeling we're going to be a playoff team. And Brian, dude, you were supposed to remind me to get your question right before we went on today. You forgot, dog. So I hope you, you know, I, I, I remember, dude. It's just more important to me than it is to you, Brian. What's up, dude? No, for real, though, I think uh, to get to his question, yeah, I mean, you kind of answered it yourself, Brian. They're putting the pieces in place. Like pretty much everywhere Shermer's gone now as a head coach, it's kind of like Wade Phillips. Wade Phillips, he said it himself. I was a lousy head coach, but I'm a very good defensive coordinator. The same can be said for Pat Shermer on the other side. History has proven he's not a good head coach. He can't juggle the whole shebang, all right? He's not built for football administration. What he's built for is coaching a quarterback and designing a, a, a scheme and calling plays on game day. If you go back in time and look at the history, just, just the last two years, all right? Eli Manning had a solid first year under Shermer in 2018, but this past season, what those two guys, Zach, were able to get out of Daniel Jones, let me remind everybody, 12 starts, over 3,000 yards passing, 24 touchdowns, 12 interceptions. Now think back to the, do you remember the year that Josh McDaniels was hired to be the head coach and the year that Cutler was coming off of his one, his one pro bowl season as a Bronco, he threw 25 touchdown passes that year. That was his six, seven, eight. That was his third year in the league. And it was a pro bowl season and he played all year long. Daniel Jones played three quarters of the season and got 24 touchdowns thanks to Shermer, thanks to Shula. So I think that portends well for Drew Locke. Here's the thing, Chad, is having a coordinator on this team that calls the right plays to fit Locke's arm and fit the Broncos system and personnel going to help? Yes. Is having someone like Shermer on staff who has a noted quarterback whisperer history going to help? Yes. But the only person that's going to help Drew Locke the most is Drew Locke. Getting out there and doing, getting out there and playing, growing with this team, growing with the system, having a full season as an NFL starter under his belt, that's what's going to make Drew Locke the next great quarterback in the NFL. Not a coach, not this uh, this changing of the guard, the changing of the regime on offense. It's going to be Drew Locke. He wants it. He's a student of the game, an alpha personality, a natural leader. He wants to be great. And as long as he has that mentality and gets on the field, he will be great. Appreciate you, Malachi. For real. means a ton. Big Daddy Kane. Thank you. One of our, especially on YouTube, OGs of the show, been commenting, been engaging with the show long before we were taking this live. Jumps in, $5 donation on Super Chat. Appreciate you. He says, let's go Niners. We can't let the Chiefs win. I agree, man. I think we're all, for the most part, there will be a few exceptions out there, but I think for the most part, Broncos country is going to be united under the Shanahan banner. Yeah, it, it would be really cool, I think, for Kyle to get a ring. And he's already made history as the first father coach, you know, to be in a Super Bowl, coaching a Super Bowl team. So we have differing opinions, I think, as to who's going to win the game. But I know for sure everyone can agree with it's going to be a very entertaining matchup uh, next Sunday. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. You know, that's one of the things like it rankles us to see the Chiefs have such success and to finally get over the hump and hoist the trophy that for which, you know, their their posthumous owner was named after. You know, you, you hate seeing that. However, the one silver lining, Zach, is that finally it's new blood in the Super Bowl on yes. the AFC side. It's not, listen, it's not Peyton. It's not Big Ben. It's not Flacco. It's not Tom. It's pretty, pretty much it, yeah. So, you know, at least there's that silver lining. Jonathan jumps in, $5 donation Thank on you, Super Chat. He says, keep up the great work. Appreciate that. Of course. Jay, now, of course, this is Jeff Cohen. Your guys' thoughts on Locke <clears throat> having the potential to be an elite quarterback in the league or above average? I never said I'd take two. Okay, I know. I know what you're talking about. Dating back to that question. I I feel you. That was my bad, dude, misinterpreting your tweet on that. But does Locke have the potential in your mind, Zach, of becoming an elite QB? Getting back to the, the shade that Matthew Judon was was throwing at him, they put him up there in the in the – that tweet in the echelon of the young elite quarterbacks, he hasn't quite proven that out over time in terms of sample size. Do you believe he's got that in him? 
Uh, Jeff, you tweeted me on uh, on Twitter, obviously, then you said that if he's not going to be Mahomes' lock, he would be more of the Aaron Rodgers. Let me just answer your question here. If the Bron- if he can be half as good as either Mahomes or Rodgers, the Broncos would sign up for that any day of the week. Can he be elite? Yes. Can he be up in that upper echelon among the Mahomes and the Aaron Rodgers and the old Tom Brady's? Yes. He has the potential, he has the ability, and he has the moxie and the can-do attitude. It comes down to coaching, as it always does, staying healthy and having the proper pieces around him. That's why I think this entire offseason, Chad, has to be about helping lock out. Put those weapons around him, protect him, and let him go to work. If that can happen, they put him in the right place, and they finally have some continuity for more than one season— he can be an elite signal caller, and I expect him to be. Longtime listeners of this show can remember that last year at this time, okay, in the pre-draft process, we, Zach and I, flew to Indianapolis. We got an up-close look at Drew Locke. We've been telling you since about this time last year that this is a kid that has franchise tools. What I like, what, what surprised me most about Drew Locke's rookie season wasn't that you know, he showed the big arm and got out there and did some, some impressive things. It's how quickly – he hit the ground running after a 10-week exile, which told yep. me I had no questions about his physical wherewithal, Zach. It was always going to be what does he have between the ears. And even though in person and you know being able to talk to him, see him talk, hear him talk about football, hear him talk about leadership, like that was all impressive. Like he checked the boxes, but in terms of the practical application of having to not only settle in to being a, a young pro, but learning a new scheme, learning to call plays, learning to drop back from under center, all these different things. And then to add to that, the extreme bitter disappointment of going on IR for 10 weeks, I was stunned at how quickly he hit the ground running when he finally got his chance in week 13 and the way he carried the team basically through that final five games of the year. So I think that all portends well, you know, getting back to the question, yes, absolutely, he's got the potential to be an elite quarterback. And that's why I don't think it's beyond the pale to include him in a tweet with those three other young quarterbacks. Bronco broad on Twitter says, not sure if you've covered this. I'm late in, but what do you think of Mike Sullivan being like, Oh, now for those of you who missed yesterday's pod, the Broncos, it was announced have decided not to renew the contract of their cap wizard, Mike Sullivan. And Mike Sullivan has been with the team since 2012 and they're cutting him loose. The The expectation is they're going to move on to someone to replace him quickly. He's the guy that was the point man on negotiations with free agents and in-house guys, as well as kind of the capologist. He's got this team sitting pretty good heading into this offseason. So we uh, we hate to see it happen, to be honest with you. We felt like he's done a pretty good job. But for, for whatever reason, internally, the Broncos feel like it's time for a change there. And like we mentioned yesterday, they have to be targeting someone already to replace Mike Sullivan. They can't go into the free agent period coming up, and they have to get their roster personnel organized, their 90-man offseason roster. They can't have their their resident cap guy not in the building. So uh, Mike Sullivan is a big loss for Denver, but he's not a fatal loss, a fatal blow for the team. They will replace him, and I think it'll be more Elway on his own now handling these contracts, and we'll see what he's made of this offseason, Chad. All right, let's grab these last couple of questions on Super Chat. And uh, we gotta we gotta get out of here now. This comes from Black Knight two thirty two, super chat twenty dollar donation. Thank he jumps you. in. Appreciate you, brother. He says, which free agent wide receivers are high on your list? If we get a free agent wide out, does that change the Broncos' draft needs? And also, do you see the Broncos cleaning the tight end room, not including Fan, and grabbing a tight end in the later rounds? Zach, answer the second part of his two part question there about the tight ends, and I'm gonna grab the wide receiver class on spot track. Well, I mean, I think it's well known by now. I'm not a big fan of Jeff Hireman. I don't think Jake Budd is going to contribute to the Broncos going forward. So they're really down to Fumagalli. They have Beck. They have Austin Ford coming back. And, of course, they have Noah Fant. In Shermer's system, uh, Fant will get his due. I think he's in for actually for a breakout season with Shermer calling the plays, even though he's not a very tight end heavy coach. But the room, yeah, I expect the Broncos to look for at least two tight ends, one in free agency, one in the draft. Not a huge glaring need this offseason, but definitely for uh, depth and insurance, they're going to take a couple tight ends, Chad. That's my prediction. Okay, here we go. On wide receivers, um, I'm not going to bog down the show for a second here trying to share screen. So let me just list some of these names. Projected unrestricted free agents heading into this offseason. A.J. Green. Nope. 32 years old, former first round top five pick, but he's been an injury case lately. Emmanuel Sanders, 33 years old. We know that ain't going to happen. Devin Funches, Mr. Dropsy himself. (laughs) Amari Cooper is interesting. Mm. Randall Cobb is interesting. Interesting. 
Danny Amendola, we already kind of got a slot guy, but, you know, depending on the price, maybe. Travis Benjamin. Mm-hmm. Rashad Perryman's an under-the-radar guy that might get some consideration. Chester Rogers, of course, Robbie Anderson. Bebe is going to be an unrestricted free agent, Demarius Thomas. Uh, Geronimo Allison, who I know Eric Trickle does not like. Matthew Slater, special teams guy for the for the uh, Patriots. Philip Dorsett, if he wasn't a first round pick for the Colts, he was an early second round pick, uh, also hitting free agency. And then we start getting into the Nelson Aguilars, Richard Higgins, Seth Roberts, Tavon Austins of the world. Of that group, Zach, I would the only one I could see the Broncos, or the only one I should say I'd be willing to really roll out the the checkbook is Amari Cooper. Yeah, he's uh, not really a burner, but he's a, the best route runner in the NFL. He had a great year with Dallas. I do think he's going back to the Cowboys though this offseason, so he'll be off the free agent market. But one other Cowboys receiver you mentioned him, Chad, is Randall Cobb. Had a really good bounce back year with him. Uh, he wouldn't cost too much. He wouldn't break the bank. And you know what? If the Broncos want to double dip signing Randall Cobb and drafting either Lamb or Ruggs or Chenault in the first round, I would not mind that at all. Double dip and really build the weaponry around Drew Locke. Dave jumps in up in Canada. Broncos country is a state of being, and Dave has proven it here today. $10 donation. Appreciate Thank you, Dave. It. He says, I'm a bit confused on what dead money is. Can you give me uh, a Cliff Notes explanation? Would it be more cap space if less dead money? Yes. Anyone to blame on why it's so high? Thanks, guys. For what it's worth, the Broncos are carrying some significant dead money this year. But under the John Elway era in the front office, the Broncos have actually been pretty dat gum disciplined as it relates to dead money. What is dead money? When you see a contract get signed, let's just say Kareem Jackson, okay? Three years, $33 million. I can't remember the exact signing bonus, okay? And I'm not going to take the time in this moment because we're running long to pull up his contract. But whatever that signing bonus is, that's money he gets up front or relatively close to up front, okay, from the team. That money is a part of what the guaranteed total is, but that money gets spread out by the team over multiple years in terms of how it's applied to the cap. So, for example, though, they let's just say to use round numbers. Well, I'll, I'm not going to pull it up. I don't have time. Let's just say to use round numbers, the Broncos gave Kareem Jackson $20 million in a signing bonus, okay? But it's a three-year, $33 million deal. So on an average per year basis, Zach, that's $11 bucks per year, but they gave him $20 million up front to sign. If they had decided, for example, let's say <clears throat> his two-game suspension to end the season – really pissed him off. And they did, they said, we're setting, we're making an example out of Kareem Jackson. And they cut him. They've already paid him $20 million, right? So that's going to be $10 million, And then any other guaranteed money that was on that contract, that's going to count toward their cap because they have to pay him that money. And that's allocated from the salary cap. So maybe that was a little convoluted way to explain it. But dead money most of the time, Dave, is money that was paid to players on a signing bonus who went on to be cut before that they could actually earn back that money as it relates to, you know, average per year. Yeah, I think I don't really math that well, Chad, so you explained it pretty well <laughs> as far as I'm concerned. It's it's a really uh, complicated process. You can search more about it on Google if you want, but uh, in terms of what Chad laid out, it's pretty much the bare bones explanation for that. Also, Dave, <clears throat> and anyone who's interested in caponomics, I would suggest you follow Bob Morris on Twitter, True. Mile High Huddle's resident cap guru. Yes. It's at Bob Morris Sports on Twitter. And hit him up with your questions because he's very responsive. He'll answer anything you've got. And he's very knowledgeable as it relates to the cap. All right, one or two more here uh, from Black Knight. Jumps back in. Five, $5 again. Wow, dude. Thank, Thank you. you. He says, also, if Denver does not grab Kareem Hunt, which free agent running back do you see us getting? I know there's issues with Melvin Gordon, but if he's a free agent, no. do we try to get him? You know, if we get a wide res- or a running back – and free agency, Zach, in my opinion, needs to be a guy who can catch the football. Let me pull up some names here who's hitting free agency. Unrestricted, Lamar Miller, Chris Thompson, LaShawn McCoy, Carlos Hyde, Melvin Gordon, uh, Theo Riddick, Peyton Barber, Frank Gore, Derek Henry, Darren Sproles, Kareem Hunt, you know, and Marshawn Lynch, Taiwan Jones. I could keep going. There's a few more. But of that group, in terms of actually paying money, Melvin Gordon's probably the one of the better receivers of that group, but I'd be actually Zach, I'd actually be more inclined to, even though this, you know, I've said otherwise before, as it relates to this group of running backs in free agency, Zach, 
I'd be more inclined to pay another two and a half million bucks to bring Theo Riddle back or Theo Riddick back, see what he can do in Shermer's offense, than going out and splurging on a free agent running back. The Broncos aren't going to go spend big money on a running back. No. But they've got Philip Lindsay's contract coming up here soon. Right, and Gordon has injury history, and uh, he wants a big deal. He held out for a big deal, and uh, I don't really see him coming to Denver. I don't really see him being that valuable in Denver either way. Any running back from the Chargers I want is Austin Eckler, but I believe he's a restricted free agent, and he's not going to probably leave the Chargers. He's the future of that franchise. So Derrick Henry offers no pass-catching upside. That's why among the free agent group, I like Kareem Hunt. I know it's taboo to say, but he's a really well-rounded running back who can help out this room. But I, I more agree with you, Chad. I would not blow May your money at that position you already have two guys under contract either bring back Theo Riddick for a few million or draft a guy for on the super cheap that's where I would go with that and they could end up doing both they could end up you know re-signing Theo Riddick something relatively team friendly and then going out and using a early day three late day two pick on a running back Mark Langley jumps back in two dollar donation thank you Mark yeah you you too you as well yeah we appreciate you but guys that's got to do it for today's episode of the huddle up podcast we're pushing 50 minutes here and we always love hanging out with you and going through and, and talking Broncos football and free agency and the draft. So it's not like we're counting minutes here, but we got to keep this one. Uh, we got, we got to cut you loose up to this point, guys. Thank you for joining us. Make sure you are following the show on Twitter at huddle up pod, simply the best way to keep your finger on the pulse of what's happening with the show in real time. And don't forget to follow my partner, Zach Kelberman on Twitter. You can find him at Kelberman NFL myself at Chad and Jensen. I'm putting the link for the merch store back into the comment stream. For those of you who missed it or got on late, you'll see it coming through right now. Huddle dash up dash pod dot my Shopify. We'll probably have a cooler uh, you know link for that here in the very near future. But again, we rushed this to get it out for now. There's only one shirt option, but by the end of this coming weekend, there will be multiple options of different pieces of swag that you can check out. So look forward to that. Also stay tuned on terms of what's coming next on the podcast. You will have a fresh episode of building the Broncos to wake up to Saturday morning on the podcast side, which is going to be followed later that day by Dove Valley deep divers. I believe it's going to be one. Oh, let me see, Let me check. Eric just reached out to me. Let me see the time real quick. So everybody knows here it's going to be, Oh no, this one's going to be uh, 3 PM mountain time. And, and that's what they're going to try and keep it as every Saturday Dove Valley deep divers. We'll be back then Sunday evening, 6 PM mountain, 8 PM Eastern of course, Monday as well. And then Tuesday there's going to be, we're going to debut building the Broncos as a live show on, to, on uh, YouTube and Facebook and Twitter as well. So look forward to that in the meantime, each and every one of you, thanks for joining us. Mile high salute to our super chat superstars. And Zach, my brother, again, thanks for getting that that side up, the merch store, and have a good weekend, bro. Have a good weekend, Chad. Have a good weekend, everybody. And stay tuned for an announcement as to more merch uh, as soon as this weekend for Sunday's podcast. All right, guys. For Zach Kelberman, I'm Chad Jensen. We will talk to you on Sunday.